Sama dengan Thomas J. Hayes, Chairman and Managing Member Great Hill Capital, langsung dari New York, Amerika Serikat. Hello Thomas, how are you doing? Hi Sasa, thanks for having me. Yeah, very good day to you. Uh, Thomas, as we know, the Fed has just released the FOMC Minutes Meeting and would still raise the Fed funds rates in the future to reduce inflation in the U.S. How do you see the hawkish stance of the Fed and its impact to the U.S. capital market? Well, Sasa, a lot of this was known. We saw in the dot plot after the last meeting uh, that the projections are they are going to raise interest rates up, the Fed funds rate, up to 5.1%. We are now at 425 to 4.5%. So we do know we have uh, maybe one or two more raises to go to meet their target. I think the key now moving forward that people have to keep in mind, and investors in particular, is the interest rate dif differential with the world. We were the first to aggressively tighten around the world, and I do believe we're gonna be one of the first to stop tightening and to finish the tightening process, whether that's at the Fed meeting or the meeting thereafter. And what that's gonna mean is that as the US rates stop going up and the rest of the world catches up, those relative interest rates in the rest of the world are gonna be more and more attractive which means money is going to continue to flow out of the U.S. dollar and weaken the U.S. dollar. And if you look historically, Sasa, uh, that usually ignites a fire in the emerging markets for emerging markets equities. Once the dollar weakens, emerging equities start to get bid. And we've already seen it in the last couple of months. The U.S. dollar uh, is uh, sniffing this out. It, it's weakened close to 10%. And then you have markets like China, which is close to 40% of the weighting in emerging markets, uh, up, you know, it, depending on the index that you look at, between 50 and 70% off of its recent lows in October. So there's a lot of opportunity moving forward, and this is a regime change. It's just getting started, and I think you're going to see some dramatic outperformance in emerging markets over developed markets in the coming years. Uh, in terms of capital markets, a mix of recession fear, does the January EFAC still access? As far as the January effect goes, uh, what we saw was we had a Santa Claus rally uh, that, that actually took place the last five trading days of 2022 and the first two of 2023. Uh, historically, when you get that, you see above average returns in the US S&P of about 9.8% versus 8.9% on any year. The other thing that we're looking at here is the presidential cycle, which is the four-year cycle. We just got through the midterm year, which is the second year of the presidential cycle, and we're now moving into the third year of the presidential cycle. Historically, since World War II, the second year is the worst year in terms of stock market performance. And 2022 lived up to that bad billing with the S&P 500 down 19.5%. Uh, however, what people are underestimating is the seasonally strong period of the first two quarters of the third year of the four-year presidential cycle, which we're just now starting, are historically the two strongest quarter for equity market returns. Now, with all the headwinds, people are distracted by the Fed, distracted by tightening, distracted by inflation. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw much better than expected equity performance for the next two quarters. And no one's looking for it. No one's positioned for it. And that's usually when you get it. OK, in the next quarter, there will be a prospect for stock market. Uh, Thomas, uh, regarding the potential for the Fed's interest rates still high in the near future, Will investors consider investing in risky markets such as the capital market, or this is actually a good momentum to re-enter the capital market? Yeah, I, I think that uh, people are getting nervous, but you have to put it in historical context. So for instance, prior to the great financial crisis in uh, 2008 to 2009, Fed funds rate were never this low. Now, we've come from zero to 4.25 to 4.5 uh, in a very short period of time. But if even if you look back as recently as uh, the late 90s, when we had a huge boom in equity markets, the Fed's fund rate was 6.5% at that time, and equity still ex it did exceptionally well. So the key is the context. So uh, the last time we had an inflation bout this aggressive was 1980 to 1982 under uh, Fed Chair 
Paul Volcker in the United States. And what happened was the S&P 500 uh, corrected 27% peak to trough. We had a very similar uh, peak to trough correction last year in the S&P 500, and everyone got bearish and, and very nervous. But what we need to keep in mind is that when the Fed is going to pause, they're not going to give us notice. And, and the exact same thing happened in October, uh, October 5th of 1982. Paul Volcker had, had been saying up until that point, we're going to keep at it, we're going to keep at it, we're going to keep at it, we're going to keep raising rates until we kill inflation. Well, inflation was still 7% and coming down in October of 1982, but he changed from the words keep at it to the words may shift tactics. And even though inflation was still near 7%, uh, the market on, on that minor shift rallied. And in the next four months, it recovered all of the 27% drop in the S&P 500 and went on to make new highs the next year. Now, now that's not saying that's definitely going to happen this time, but it is saying that uh, I think people are underestimating even if the Fed holds rates high and does not cut holds rates, let's say they get to 5% and they hold them there for, for several years, equities can do still do exceptionally well. We saw the exa exact same thing in 1994. The Fed had to raise rates very, very quickly that year. The stock market did poorly. Uh, and then they kept rates elevated from 1995 to 1999. And the stock market had four of its best years in history. So I think what we have to keep in mind is the Fed is not going to give us an invitation in the mail to go buy equities because they're going to be pausing in coming months. When they make that shift, it's going to be abrupt and it's going to be overnight and the market's going to respond accordingly. So the way we look at it, Sasa, is you want to start to buy highest quality equities that have that are on sale. Some are down over 50 percent that you look at out, you know, two to three years and you say, is this business going to be bigger in two to three years and doing well in two to three years than it is today? And if the answer is yes, now's the time to start to, to nibble in because historically equities are a better hedge for inflation moving forward. So in general, do you think main indexes of false rates rate still continue to decline? Well, interest rates, uh, I think, are going to go up for the next meeting or two, maybe 25 basis points and then possibly another 25 basis points. And then at the, um, uh, they're going to be held at those high levels. I think the stock market uh, has already responded to a lot of pain that's, that that's going to cause and did so with a peak to trough correction last year of over 25%. So, you know, we don't know for certain where the bottom is, but we do think that more of the pain has already happened. It's already in the rearview mirror, and it's the time to be in the market buying high quality businesses that are already down 40, 50, 60% in some cases uh, and ease into them uh, at this time because when they stop hiking, if you wait for them to, to signal that it's already clear, many of these equities will have already had 30, 40, 50% moves. It's similar to the people who are waiting for uh, Xi to end zero COVID. If they waited for him to end zero COVID, they would have missed a 40, 50 percent rally in equities because equities started to rally ahead of the fact, not after the fact. And I think that's what you have to do here is be prudent. You, they've given you their guidance that they're going to do a couple more hikes. So we know we're coming to the end of the tightening cycle in the U.S. And therefore, it's an opportunity to get in uh, in these high quality business that are marked down. Okay, what an interesting discussion, but we have to uh, come, come back first. So we will be right back after the commercial break, so stay with us. Dan pemirsa, jangan kemana-mana, karena dialog masih akan kami lanjutkan usai jeda tetaplah bersama kami di Closing Bell.
menyaksikan Evening Up. Kami sajikan informasi terlengkap seputar dunia ekonomi. Pertumbuhan ekonomi Indonesia itu sangat solid. Kami rangkum berita pergerakan pasar saham dari dalam dan luar negeri hanya untuk Anda. Senada dengan bursa Asia, bursa di kawasan benua biru juga kompak menguat. Saksikan Evening Up, Senin sampai Jumat jam 5 sore, live di CNBC Indonesia. Simak tips terlengkap dalam mengelola keuangan bersama para ahli. Masyarakat jadi belum mampu menghitung perencanaan finansial yang tepat. Dapatkan informasi seputar ragam produk investasi serta analisis resikonya. Jenisnya ada tiga ya, pengeluaran wajib, butuh, dan ingin. Saksikan Invest Time Senin dan Jumat jam 6 sore live di CNBC Indonesia. Selamat pagi, selamat datang di Skokbox. Mengawal dinamika pembukaan pasar serta menganalisis data pasar bersama para expert. Komponen yang paling penting tentu saja kita bicara tentang angka-angka ekonomi. Menyajikan riset terlengkap dan informasi terkini seputar aksi korporasi. Tightening policy mereka yang mungkin sampai Februari. Saksikan Squawk Box, Senin sampai Jumat jam 8 pagi, live di CNBC Indonesia. Menyajikan secara lengkap perkembangan tren properti di Indonesia. Dan terbukti kita jualan hampir 225 unit. Mengulas strategi bisnis perusahaan properti dan tips investasi properti terbaik di tanah air. Untuk payment yang kita subsidi, kemudian rate bunga juga kita subsidi, ya kan? Saksikan Property Point setiap Rabu jam 6 sore di CNBC Indonesia. Anda kembali menyaksikan closing bell, kita lanjutkan kembali dialog bersama dengan Thomas J. Hess, Chairman and Managing Member Great Hill Capital. Thomas, prior to the commercial break, we were talking about the global stock market. Let's talk about the stock market in emerging markets. How do you perceive the resiliency of stock market in Asia and also emerging markets in line with the trend of high interest rates? Is it still interesting or appealing Or investors just tend to wait for this stormy era of high interest rates to subside? Uh, well, it's not only interesting and attractive, it's the most attractive set of equities to be buying globally. You want to be focused on emerging markets. And what we see right now is you can buy the emerging markets index today in 2023 at 2007 prices, 16 years ago, despite all the increase in, in uh, GDP in the emerging markets. So historically, emerging markets equities will trade opposite to the US dollar. When the dollar stops going up and starts coming down as it did in 2002, 2009, 2016, and 2020, that's when you see mo- monster rallies in emerging market equities, which you're starting to see right now. So just like we saw in, in 2001 uh, to 2002, the dollar started coming down. Uh, and what you saw was emerging markets rallied 480% from 2002 to 2007. The same thing happened from 2009 to 2011. The dollar started coming down off of, uh, off of big, big time strength. And in those two years of emerging market equities rallied 189%. The same thing happened from 2016 to 2018, dollar weekend. Emerging markets was up 100% in those two years. And then the same thing in 2020 to 2021, dollar weekend and emerging markets equities were up 97%. So this will certainly be the best trade over the next couple of years. Uh, the dollar has now fallen almost 10% in the last couple of months. And that's why you're seeing the bid in emerging market uh, equities, irrespective of interest rates. And I think people are underestimating still the impact of China's abrupt reopening and dropping of the zero COVID policy. They've done an about face on the internet platforms. They're now supporting the internet platforms. That's attracting foreign investment back into emerging markets of which China is of uh, close to 40% weight. And the Chinese government just in the last couple of weeks set their GDP target for 2023 at 5%. I think the world is underestimating the impact. This, this economy has basically been closed for two years. And when the second largest economy in the world 
sets a 5% GDP target and they can actually meet it now because the people are, are free and they're out from zero COVID and go, can go about their activity, I think a rising tide is going to lift all boats, not only in the developed markets, but in all of the emerging markets. And that's exactly where you want to be right now uh, moving forward. And then the last thing is that China can, can continue with aggressive stimulus because they have uh, fewer inflation worries. They've been stocking up energy from Russia at $60 a barrel. Uh, so they, they can do fiscal stimulus. They can do monetary stimulus. Unlike the developed world who's worried about inflation, uh, their fiscal and monetary uh, stimulus is more in a tightening mode versus an easing mode. Uh, and that's why you want to take advantage of emerging markets over the next few years. And we're very, very positive on the outlook uh, for that asset class. Okay, so investors might consider the impact of reopening economy in China also. Uh, Thomas, uh, do you think there is a rebalancing portfolio from stock market to bond market? What about the prospect of bond market in the midst of global uncertainty and the threat of recession that will hit one third of the world's country as currently there is an inverted yield curve in US bonds? Yeah, this is a trap. Uh, a lot of people are looking at the nominal yield on bonds and saying, wow, if I can get 5% uh, or in this case, 4% on two year treasuries and I don't have to take any risk, that's great. Uh, but what they don't realize is they're taking huge risks because inflation, even though the Fed is talking 2%, what they're trying to do is pin long-term inflation expectations. Inflation is going to run 3 to 5% for the next three to five years, just like it did uh, after World War II when, when our debt to GDP was 120%, just like it is today. They have to run inflation above trend in order to bring that ratio down. In 1948 to 1953, they brought debt to GDP down from 120% down to 63% by running inflation above trend. And if you have four or even 5% in short-term bonds, you may think you're getting a good deal, but if let's say your, your, your yield is 4.2%, uh, you know, close to what it is on the two year yield right now, but inflation is still running, you know, three to 5%, call it 4%, your real return is zero and inflation is, you know, still running hot. So, what we've seen historically is the best hedge for inflation is high quality equities that have pricing power. Uh, if you look at Coca-Cola, for instance, uh, last year alone, every single year they raise the price of their syrup that they give to restaurants for the fountains, et cetera. They raised their product prices four to 8%, depending on the category, just last year alone. So that's gonna be your better hedge against inflation is buying high quality equities, that have a brand moat that can increase the price of their products and, and the, the customers will take those prices uh, moving forward. So we think there's a lot of opportunity with high quality equities that's gonna be a much better hedge for any type of inflation than bonds will be. Bonds is an illusion. The, the nominal yield looks high, but adjusted for inflation, you're not gonna get much mm -hmm. on your money. You might get a, a short-term peace of mind, but uh, you know, with bonds up, uh, and equities down, the opportunity now is to buy equities and in particular emerging market equities as the dollar weakens. Those are going to dramatically outperform any inflation in the near and intermediate terms. Okay, well, thank you for sharing your insight, Thomas J. Hayes, Chairman and Managing Member, Grad Hill Capital. Have a great day to you.